Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good in Unity. We're going to try something a bit different today and do a visual effect case study for one of my favorite games, Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. But before we jump in, if you're new to Unity Particle Systems, you might want to check out my video Particles 102 because I am going to assume you've got a bit of particle system knowledge for this video. The particle effects in Wind Waker are freaking awesome. They're simple yet stylized, they match the tune aesthetic of the game's art perfectly, and their swirled puffy shapes would go on to become a staple of many future Zelda titles. I've done my best to recreate the effect of a bomb explosion using only Unity's shuriken particle system. There were a couple bumps along the way and I had to cheat a little bit, but all said and done, I'm happy with how the effect turned out. We'll start with a single frame of explosion shortly after detonation. We'll need to see it in motion later on, but for now, let's isolate the subcomponents of the effect. We have the main blast in the center, one big cloud that expands quickly and then slowly dissolves. Next, we have the outer ring, surrounding the central blast, floating just above the ground. Finally, we have the debris, which, if you look closely, consists of a rocky shape being chased by tails of smoke, whose color seems to match the rock part. The whole effect seems to get away with just two designs for the swirls. I'm not 100% sure about this, but we'll pretend it does for now. Alright, let's get started. We'll begin with the main central component, starting by slapping on a material. I mentioned how there looks to be at least two variations on the swirly puff, so I've made a texture that has my two puff drawings in a single image. When we apply this to the particle system, we of course see both particle designs and that doesn't look great. Here's a cool trick though. In the particle rollout, expand texture sheet animation. We'll set the tiling to x equals 1 and y equals 2, matching the tile layout of the texture. And then for the animation, we select single row, which reveals the random row toggle. Enabling this, 50% of our particles will use the top puff design, and 50% will use the bottom. You don't have to worry about the frame over time and cycles here, because there are only one frame of animation in each row. That's a neat trick that I'm not sure is the intended use of the texture sheet animation, but it's a quick and effective way to add some variation to your particle systems. For the shape and emission, I'm going with a sphere and a burst of 50 particles. I don't give the sphere a radius because I want the explosion to burst from a single point in space, so the shape really just defines the possible vectors for particle velocities. Moving on, many of the starting values are going to use random between two constants, again to add variation. We'll also include a small gravity modifier. The negative sign means our particles will slowly float up, the way we'd expect smoke and fire to. If you play your particle system now, you'll see particles go flying out at crazy speeds, which is what we'd expect with the speed set to a random between 20 and 35. The thing is, we actually want particles to move that fast, but only right as the explosion starts. Then we want them to quickly decelerate. There are a couple ways we could do this, but we'll use the limit velocity over lifetime property. This property puts a limit on how fast particles can move. When particles are moving faster than that limit, their speed is reduced. The rate at which their velocity falls to the limit value is based on the dampen value. A dampen value of 1 means instantly bring speeds above the limit down to it. We'll use 0.3, meaning reduce speeds by 30% per second until they meet the limit. With our starting speed range and these values for the limiter, we get a blast like this. Nice. Now let's color this thing. I showed how color over time works in my previous particle tutorials, and the values I've keyed in here shouldn't look too wild. We basically go from a hot white flame, through some yellows, oranges, and a shade of red, and end on a grey for when the smoke is clearing. The alpha value stays pretty high throughout and leaves most of the fading out until the end when the particles are a smoky shade of grey. I wasn't exactly sure on size over time component, but a nice rounded curve like this looks alright. And finally, we'll toss in a bit of random rotation over time. That covers the main portion of the blast, and it looks pretty good. We won't worry about the first frame particles popping into existence because A, explosions happen really fast, and B, there's going to be a whole lot else going on. Moving on to the outer ring, it's actually very similar to the central blast. It goes through similar colors and similar speed and size. The key difference is that it emits in a ring shape and lasts only about half the time of the center. So we basically just duplicate the center, change its shape module, and reduce the lifetime start range, right? Well then what the hell is going on here? This doesn't look at all like we'd expect it. The main blast is occluding our ring, but a lot of those ring particles are clearly closer to the camera than the central blast. To explain what's going on, we need a quick explanation of transparency sorting woes. GPUs have got opaque geometry down. By writing and reading from the depth buffer, opaque objects can render to the screen in any order and appear correct. But transparency causes a whole bunch of problems. Consider the following. A partially transparent object A 
and another object B are being rendered. If we render the scene from back to front, B is drawn, and then A is drawn afterwards, performing an alpha blend or whatever, and the scene looks as we would expect. But what if we rendered the scene from front to back? We would draw object A and, while it would incorrectly perform its alpha blend with the skybox, then we would go to draw object B. If A wrote to the depth buffer, B might decide it shouldn't draw at all, but otherwise, we just don't know how to draw B correctly. The typical approach is to draw all opaque geometry in the scene, with writing to the depth buffer enabled. Then draw the alpha blended stuff, reading from the depth buffer, but never writing to it. When we draw the alpha stuff, we just sort the objects by their distance to the camera and hope for the best. But even this causes issues. For example, what if A completely encapsulates B? Now there's just no way to sort this correctly. Does this situation look familiar? We can't think of each individual particle as a single sorted object. Particle systems are implemented such that each system is a single object. They're sorted based on their Z distance to the camera, and no matter how you sort, there's just no way to get this nice ring surrounding our central blast. Particle systems have sort modes and sorting fudge, but unfortunately, the former only allows us to choose how particles sort within a single system, and the latter just alters the calculated distance to the camera for that system, changing the entire system's render order. To get around this, we're just going to cheat and use multiple systems. Take the number of particles in the ring blast and divide that by 6, then change the arc on the shape from 360 down to 60. Now we can offset these pie slices from the center a bit, and rotate each one by 60 degrees. This gives us a nice ring that sorts properly in most cases. With that finished, let's move on to debris. We'll be fighting against sort issues a bit here as well, so we'll do the same divide and conquer here, this time using five systems. Now the actual rock chunk is a bit strange. We're just going to set up a one particle burst. It'll have a high start speed and a big gravity modifier to pull it back down. The real magic here will be the sub emitter. By setting a burst sub emitter, when the rock chunk is fired, this particle system will be launched with it. We'll make this subsystem have a distance based emission so it paints an even tail of particles as the rock flies. The interesting thing to note with the tail is that it will use the rock's color over time gradient as its start color. This means the tail's color will match the color of the rock. We'll do the same thing with the size. The rock's size over time curve will be the tail's start size curve. Aside from that, the tails are a simple 1 second fading swirl with no other surprises. Now that we have so many different particle systems, it'll be useful to have a single script to control the playback of all of them. To make things easy, we'll just expose public fields of particle systems and write a play method that tells all of them to play. Our explosion is coming along, but it's still missing something. The original freeze frame we dissected was just a bit too far into the blast to see everything going on. In the first few frames, there's an explosion of light in a sunburst shape, and moments later sparks fly out from the ends of that sunburst. I decided to consider these as two separate components, the sunburst and the sparks. The sunburst is quite simple. If you make a texture for it, you can just have a particle system emit a single instance of that using an additive blended material, and it looks pretty much like the game. One small thing to note is the max particle size property. Its default value is 0.5, which means a particle can only take up half the viewport. But we want this thing to be massive, so we'll set it to 1. This way it can consume the whole screen when the player is standing close enough to it. Now the sparks, if you thought the ring sorting trick was cheating, well then this is going to look like sorcery. The sparks basically fly out in a circle, have a short lifetime, and shrink as they fly outwards. Sounds easy, but in practice there are two issues. First, there's no way to tell the system to emit particles in a circle that faces the camera, so we'll need to give our system a circular shape, and whenever we play it, have that face the camera before it fires. Second, once a particle fires, we need it to point in the direction of its velocity. Unfortunately, there's no option to do this built into the system, so this has to be hacked into a little script. I rolled both these fixes into a mono behavior with its own play method, and now our explosion script can just call play on that instead of the particle system directly. For the finishing touches, I made a Zelda style bomb and added a little camera shake and BAM! It's quite a compelling recreation of the source material. Using this as a base, you could recreate the enemy death effect or other particle blast from the game. The link will be in the description to the Unity package containing the prefabs, textures, and materials. Even better than remaking more Zelda effects, try remixing the effects with your own textures, matching the color palette of your own game, and putting any other spin on it you can imagine. Thanks for sticking with me through this first ever case study. I'd love to do more videos like this in the future, exploring unique effects and visual styles of popular games. If you have a particular effect you'd love to see recreated in Unity, leave me a comment and I might cover it in a future video. Thanks again for watching, keep on making those video games.